Welcome to Data Skeptic Time Series. This is Data Skeptic Time Series, the podcast about how to predict the future based on historical sequential data. Episode number. The Hubble Space Telescope was launched in 1990 and has been sending down a stream of observations from space since then. As this imaging data streams in, there's more observational data coming in than any human being can observe. Thus, people turn to algorithms to automate some of the image processing. In particular, it's outliers that are of interest to many scientists. They want to review this cosmic survey for items that don't easily conform to expectation. Today on the show, I speak with Leo Shamir about techniques for automating the identification of outliers in this data set. What exactly is it about galaxies that might get them labeled as peculiar? And Leo Shamir from Kansas State University. I invited you on to talk about the paper, Automatic Identification of Outliers in Hubble Space Telescope Galaxy Images. So a lot of fun stuff to get into. Maybe to start, I think everybody knows a little bit about the Hubble Telescope. Could you tell us about the data we get back from it? Are these just PNG files or what do you start from? Okay, so, uh, well, the Hubble Space Telescope, it collects, uh, first of all, there are several instruments on the Hubble Space Telescope, not just the main camera, but it collects all sorts of data. We know the Hubble Deep Field, which is one frame that was uh, one segment of the sky that was collected for several days. It's very long exposure, go deep. But there are other surveys done by Hubble Space Telescope. And what I looked into was the Cosmos survey. These are several fairly large survey covering a relatively large part of the sky like for instance the cosmos was at two square degrees it doesn't sound a whole lot but in hubble terms that's pretty big because hubble goes really deep deeper than ground-based telescopes so that's what i cover but the data that you get is image data that i used in comes in format called feats that's a format that is very common in astronomy it's not very common outside the field of astronomy but that's the standard format of astronomy it's uniqueness is that it allows to make photometric measurements from the data in JPEG or formats like that that we often use, I know, in ImageNet or things like that. JPEG, you cannot really make scientific photometric measurements uh, because the dynamic range is compression in the way the fits, that's uh, each pixel is represented not by an RGB and one byte for each color channel, but uh, actually it's a wider dynamic range that allows photometric measurements. And what sorts of scientific questions do people have about these images? I imagine they're useful for lots of different things, but in your experience, what are some of the neat questions we can ask from this data? Right, so a lot of those images, they answer questions about galaxy evolution and the nature of galaxies. Mainly Hubble Space Telescopes and other space telescopes, they go and uh, image uh, extragalactic objects. So in this case, the Cosmos uh, survey that was meant to study galaxies galaxies, extragalactic objects, and the evolution. And you get the evolution of the galaxy, you can learn by shape, and you can correlate the shape with their photometry and other things that you can measure them sometimes, what the galaxies are made of, that you can learn from uh, spectroscopy of the galaxies and so on. What sort of training does it take to be capable of helping provide some labels on this data? I guess, actually, I'm asking specifically from a human's point of view, maybe I should clarify, and uh, not necessarily machine learning training, but do I have to be a PhD to help identify some things in images? Well, that depends on what you want to really identify there, because there were several attempts, several projects that involved actually people who had very little training, and they just looked at the images through a website, and they annotated those images manually. And that was the early ways of annotating uh, galaxies, just by asking a large number of people to go in and look at those images they see on the web and annotate them. And that was fairly successful. You have a lot, of, obviously, you can you have a lot of noise because you don't know who these people are you don't know how focused they are on their tests so you have a lot of noise but when you plan it statistically you're left out with some good data that people even if they're not trained in astronomers uh, can do but uh, that's mainly for, let's say the number of arms that a galaxy has or the tightness of the arms of the galaxy things like that that non-experts can do and then there are other things like 
detecting maybe supernova in the galaxy or separating supernova from from star clusters, from very large star clusters in the galaxy or things like that, that maybe require a little bit more experience. And I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on the volume of data. Is this just something we need four or five graduate students with a little stipend looking at these four hours a day and that'll cover it? Or what's the workload? Okay, that's a good question. Astronomical databases are among or maybe the largest public databases that are there. Whether you're talking about in this specific paper, you're talking about Hubble, but it's not just Hubble. There are many other telescopes, either space-based or ground-based. And it's important to know that we used to think of a telescope as something that we selected target in the sky, a celestial object of of some sort, and we point the telescope to it, and we take an image, and we make some measurements, and that's how we learn about the object. But this was the past, basically, and it is being changed into robots, and telescopes, modern telescopes are actually robots. They image the sky every night, all night, and they create databases. And when an astronomer wants to see a certain object, you don't go to some hill somewhere and get a telescope time, you actually go to the database and you get all the information from there. And that really increases the efficiency of those telescopes because basically an infinite number of people can use one telescope, but it also allows to make new observations that were not possible. It's a data-driven observation, completely new way to look at the universe. In my opinion, the most important advancement in astronomy since the invention of the telescope. And but back to your question, that leads to very, very large databases. No, five, six graduate students cannot annotate hundreds of millions of galaxies that we can be imaged by a single telescope. We have to use automation. Even Hubble Space Telescope, which is not the largest database, it doesn't have the widest throughput of image data. Even Hubble Space Telescope, there's no practical way to annotate that without automation. We have to use computers here. Can you talk a bit about your vision for that automation? Are we just going to train one good, maybe deep learning classifier model that labels everything? Or do we need more of a collaborative human in the loop workflow? Right, so that depends. So deep learning algorithms can do a lot, or machine learning algorithms can do a lot in some of the work. That it's a question whether machine learning will be able to do everything that we need. We still have some problems that are a little bit more tricky to solve. The morphology of galaxies is not simple. And also in this case, identifying objects that are peculiar galaxies that are different from the Hubble sequence, but are still astronomical objects and not artifacts or some bad things that happen during the imaging process. These are real objects. And deep learning algorithms struggle with that. And we did try to apply deep learning algorithms to that. And we didn't get actually the performance that we wanted to get, something that will allow us to practically analyze the data. And we need to go to other solutions. Well, in principle, I very much like what you described. Could there be a way of finding peculiar galaxies? But what is the mathematical definition of peculiar? Right. There's no clear scientific definition of what's peculiar. So what we can do is use the Hubble sequence. So there's something called the Hubble classification scheme. And most galaxies in the universe fit into some stage on that Hubble classification scheme, which shows how galaxies maybe change from one form to another. But most galaxies in the universe fit into some class on that classification scheme. So what we're looking for are galaxies that are not on that classification scheme, not on the Hubble sequence, but that is a very broad definition because galaxies may be different from each other. There's no one definition of what a galaxy should look like, and there's no definition of what a peculiar galaxy should look like. So it's a broad definition, and we actually let the algorithm lead the way for us and let the algorithm find the galaxies that are most different than the most of the population of the galaxies that we have in the database. Very neat. So I know from reading the paper, that's an unsupervised technique. Could you talk about some of the advantages in going with a unsupervised over a supervised approach? We are looking for peculiar objects that have not been seen before. And if we have a peculiar galaxy that we have not seen, we don't know it exists, we cannot train a machine learning system. We cannot train a system with something we don't know exists. And that's what we're looking for. And that's why we needed to go into an unsupervised learning so we can find things 
that we don't use for the training of the system. And that's basically what we're looking for. If we train the system with object we know, then the system would have identified galaxies of types that we're already familiar with. And that's not what we want to do. We can assume that if we have a database of, in that case, about over 200,000 galaxies that are imaged in relatively deep space, some of them will be new. Some of them will be galaxies of type that we have not seen before. And that's what we're looking for. Thanks to this week's sponsor, Vertica. Vertica's ML-powered analytics is designed for pioneers. It's a truly unified platform. Vertica lets you keep your data where it is. Vertica offers cloud variety, giving you the flexibility to use multiple clouds, on-prem storage, or a hybrid or both, with the ability to read from different formats across all of them. With superior query speeds, sophisticated SQL analytics, and greater accuracy, Vertica gives you the power and performance to take your business to new heights. Vertica is built to adapt and provides the tools and agility to evolve with the future of analytics. Vertica is analytics for pioneers. Head to vertica.com slash insights to learn more. There you can read how other data pioneers use Vertica to realize over 2.2 million in benefits through better business insights and less effort. That's vertica.com slash insights. Gotcha. So I know you can frame this as an outlier detection problem. I'm curious, were you able to leverage any of the traditional outlier detection techniques or did you have to invent something new? Well, we tried several approaches. Uh, the first thing that we tried was to use the deep learning autoencoders. And it gave us fairly good results on a control data set. But then for when we applied it for practical, for real world data coming from Hubble Space Telescopes, also other telescopes, we didn't get the results that we wanted. Maybe because also the regular galaxies are very different from each other. There's a whole spectrum of galaxies that are considered regular, but they don't look alike at all. And that might have negatively affected the performance of of the autoencoders, in addition to some images that are artifacts, that something was wrong with the imaging that may look different from everything else, but they're not really. They don't have any astronomical value. Uh, that's one thing that we tried. Then we went to try using feature engineering and came up with a collection of numerical features that describe the galaxies and apply some outlier detection on those. During the process, we adjusted it and came up with the algorithm that's in the paper that we use the entropy basically to rank features that we have. And with that, we have a distance measurement. With this distance measurement, we ignore some of the closest objects to make the distance. Why? Because that's something that we don't have in many outlier detection algorithms, that we can have a peculiar galaxy, but the peculiar galaxy might have other galaxies that look like it, but also present in the database. So the a single galaxy can appear, the same form can appear several times. It still would be peculiar. It still would be peculiar but can appear more than one time in the database. And many in some outlier detection algorithm, they might, if they, you have several peculiar galaxies of the same kind, they might not be considered outliers anymore. And that's not what we want. We want to detect them. And that's why we have those rank distances and we just ignore the closest neighbor when you do the distancing. We ignore the closest neighbors just to make sure that if you have more than one instance of the galaxy, it won't be missed by the algorithm. When you're calculating distance, is that on just sort of the raw bit data of the image or do you do some transformation or feature engineering and then do a comparison on like a maybe a reduced space or a transformed space or something like that? Right. So we do feature engineering and we use the value. The values we compute the entropy of each feature to select. Uh, so we reduce, basically we reduce the space because we start with a fairly big space. And then with the distances that we use, we use the earth movers distance. Got it. So then would it be fair to make the analogy that as you appeal to entropy, it's kind of like saying, find me the galaxies which would need the longest description in order to distinguish them from their neighbors? Something of the kind, something like that. Basically, we use the entropy to eliminate some of the features because we don't know what the galaxies, what the peculiar galaxies would look like. We know we're not expecting them. We don't know what features we're going to use. So we let the features be selected automatically. And we use the entropy for that. And we use features 
that have low entropy, but not zero. Zero entropy would be useless. So we have a range there. And then we use the earth movers distance because a lot of the features are actually histograms convolved into histograms. So that's why we use the earth movers distance, not something like Lydian distance or Minkowski distances or something like that, because we want to have an accurate measurement of distances between set of histograms that we have. I know the distinctions of type 1 and type 2 errors aren't really appropriate here because you don't have a ground truth, but do you have any sense of something like that, the degree to which your algorithm might produce a few too many galaxies that actually turn out to be boring, which I guess is okay because they can be filtered, but maybe the more concerning group as well, those that were peculiar but seemed mundane. Right. Well, when testing the algorithm, then we prepare the data set of galaxies that we would be considered peculiar in the universe trained by the algorithm. So we define a different problem that necessarily doesn't necessarily reflect the universe. So for instance, we trained the algorithm with just elliptical galaxies and then added a little bit of spiral galaxies and tried to measure how often it identified those spiral galaxies. That was in the early stages of the development of the algorithm. And the contention is that if in a universe of elliptical galaxies, a spiral galaxy would be peculiar. But that assumption might be good for basically for a simple experiments. We cannot apply that assumption to the universe because the universe has a broad range of galaxies so after getting the first results that we had the only way to measure that it's really doing what we want it to do is to apply just apply it on a very large number of galaxy images in this paper coming from Hubble Space Telescope and seeing what it returns and that's what we have in the paper all the galaxies that the algorithm detected now these are real galaxies these pe real peculiar galaxies that were not identified before and they look different than many of the what we call regular galaxies and we have some gravitational lenses some new gravitational lenses that we that the algorithm detected some other forms of galaxies but these are actual galaxies it's not like an experiment a control experiment what the paper has what the paper has is real galaxies that really exist somewhere in the sky that the algorithm detected well, I would guess, given the results I'm seeing in the paper, and I know it's a recent work, so maybe this is things in progress, but probably a next step is let's take this and put it in practice, whether that be to, I don't know, prioritize human reviewers or help in some other workflow. Is anything going on or do you have some directions you're going to head for using this in practical settings? Well, absolutely. Well, the paper itself is already practical implementation of it because, uh, like I said before, those galaxies that were identified by the algorithm, these are real galaxies, real peculiar galaxies that were not known before. And the algorithm was able to detect those galaxies and they might be useful by many researchers who study evolution of galaxies and might want to take a look at galaxies that don't look like other galaxies. And those galaxies, they carry a lot of information about the past and the present and the future universe by their unusual shape. It's an interesting question, what make those galaxies look like what they really look? So the paper is actually has a practical application identifying more than 100 galaxies, peculiar galaxies in Hubble Space Telescope. We had some similar thing, not as big, but a similar application in the past to identify peculiar objects. But definitely it's going, the algorithm next step is applying the algorithm to databases much larger than the Hubble Space Telescope, like the Penn Stars for instance, or like the, Vera, the future Vera Rubin Observatory, which is going to see first light in 2022. That is going to be much powerful than any other telescope that we had in the past. It's going to be the world's largest public database. And you can assume that in the 10 billion galaxies that is expected to image, you're going to have a lot of galaxies of paramount scientific interest that are going to be extremely difficult to find without algorithms. So that's definitely where this algorithm is going. Yeah, if you're already finding some novel needles in the haystack in Hubble, it should generalize, I would expect, to some of the other data sets. Although that's an interesting question as well. Uh, is there any potential challenges you foresee in migrating the approaches to those other data sets? I don't know if they're fundamentally different measurements in any way. Well, we use image data, so the data aren't that different, but there are still challenges because... Also in that paper, not every object detected by the algorithm is indeed a peculiar object. And in fact, 
most objects that the algorithm detects and we looked at the top 1000 objects that the algorithm recommended and we see that about 100 are indeed peculiar so it gives 10 times more data than what we're really asking for so it's not 100% accurate it's not even close to 100% accurate and that's something that we will need to improve on the other hand it makes the data about two or three orders of magnitude smaller and it makes it practical to analyze. If 250,000 images of Hubble uh, Space Telescope will be difficult to analyze manually, reducing it to 1,000 images, that's something that can be done. So right now it's reducing the data by several orders of magnitude, but it's still not 100% accurate. Probably it won't be 100% accurate in the near future, but it can be better and more accurate than it is right now. Well, maybe those graduate students will be helpful after all, then, if they have a smaller data set. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I know you have a long background in computer science, so no surprise you have the algorithmic chops and things to do the implementation and all that. Can you tell me a little bit about how you develop the necessary skills and background in astronomy to participate in something like this? So I like astronomy. I mean, I don't have formal education in astronomy, and it was a process to learn uh, that, to learn it from, uh, learn by doing it and making many mistakes at first, not understanding how the field works and how things are done and what are the questions that interest astronomers. And, and I'm still learning. I'm still in the process of learning. But by doing the work, by going to conferences in astronomy, by working with astronomers, and I had many collaborators who are astronomers, I'm part of the, let's say, the Vera Rubin Observatory, where I'm probably the only computer scientist, the only person with formal computer science education on that collaboration. Maybe there are a few more, but almost, almost everyone is a physicist or astronomer. With all that, I just acquiring the knowledge that I need. And like I said, I'm still learning. It's still a process. Well, what's next for you in this line of work? Or maybe if you're studying other things as well? Well, on astronomy, I focus on galaxy morphology. There's a lot of things to do on galaxy morphology, more accurate measurements of the galaxy. So we have the deep neural network algorithms that can do a lot, that can improve the measurements by a lot, but we still have like fine measurements, specific things that we want to measure for the galaxies and make scientific conclusions out of them. And for that, they might need a different algorithm or advancing the uh, convolutional neural networks that we're using right now. And other questions that are not related to necessarily supervised machine learning, finding those needles in the haystack, those things that we don't necessarily expect, the, the novelty that we don't necessarily expect. And another thing is making cosmological view of these findings, or cosmological scale view of these findings, studying galaxy morphology in the context of, and not the astrophysical scale, but the cosmological scale, and studying galaxy evolution through that perspective. And now it's possible because we have all those robotic telescopes collecting hundreds of millions of galaxies it made possible before the information era, there was no practical way of doing it. But now we have completely new ways of looking at the universe. We just need computing to do that. Well, very exciting. Laura, is there anywhere people can follow you online? I have my webpage. I have a Twitter account, which I rarely use, but I, every time something is discovered, I sometimes put it there. So on Twitter, it might be useful. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I'll have that in the show notes for people to check out. Well, thank you again so much for coming on to share your expertise. This is a cool project. <laughs> thank you so much, and thanks for inviting me. I enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to another installment of Data Skeptic Time Series. Our guest today was Lior Shamir. Our episode was sponsored by Vertica. And please stay with us as we have another episode of Orders of Magnitude coming up next. With myself, Claudia Armbruster, as associate producer, Vanessa Bly, who does guest coordination, and our host, Kyle Polich. This is the second installment of our statistical game show, Orders of Magnitude, in which I have some guests come on and I present four statistics, one of which will be correct. The other three are going to be off by at least one order of magnitude. So if I were to say something like pi is approximately 3.14, that's the correct answer. If I said it was 31.4, that's off by one order of magnitude. Or even if I said it's 99, that's off by an order of magnitude because it's times 10, give or take the digit.
So I've brought back on the same panelists we had for the inaugural instance of this. Vanessa and Claudia, why don't you give a quick bio for listeners who haven't heard the first one yet? Hi, I'm Claudia. I'm the podcast producer for the show. I edit the episodes. Hi, I'm Vanessa. I am the guest coordinator for the show. I get the guests on here. And we're going to get some guests on orders of magnitude at some point once we get the kinks worked out here. For the record, I will answer any questions that fall into the category of stoichiometry. So if I give you something in miles and you want it in hectares, I can do that conversion for you. Just ask. This is not about arithmetic. It's about sniffing out which is a truthful statistic or not. So we've got three categories for today. FOIA requests, the Freedom of Information Act, wildfires, and corn statistics. Starting with FOIA, do either of you have a background? Uh, have you filed the FOIA perhaps or know much about them? I have not. No, I do not know anything about them. I haven't either, but I've gotten more interested, especially since we quickly mentioned it on the show, I've gotten more feedback than usual on this topic. And the Freedom of Information Act is where citizens, at least in the U.S., can submit requests to the government that certain information be disclosed. So our statistics are going to come from justice.gov today. The statistics will cover the costs of how much the government pays to do FOIA requests. It will cover who the largest department is that get FOIA requests, what percentage are denied, and how long they typically take. First statistics, at least in 2018, FOIA processing costs, that's how much the government has to pay in order to deliver on these requests, those costs were $5.0 billion per year. All right, statistic number two, DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, is the largest department that gets these requests. They get 45% of all requests. Third statistic, 62% of the requests are denied in full, meaning the government will not give them any information back. Last statistic, 250 days processing time for simple track requests is the average response time for getting your data back from a FOIA. So $5 billion, 45% of DHS, 62% denied, and 250 days processing time. One of those is correct. The other three are off by at least an order of magnitude. Vanessa, why don't you go first? What do you think? I think it's true that 62% are denied. All right. Claudia, how about you? I don't want to just piggyback off Vanessa, <laughs> but I think the, yeah, I think the same thing. I think it's the 62% are all denied. 62%. All right. So you both agree on this one. Uh, and that is one of the fictions. In fact, only 6.2% are denied. Or at least the, the category is denied in full. I think maybe why this one would catch people is because you're thinking these might be sensational. Like, I want to know what George Bush had for lunch and it's none of my business. This is like, I want to know where my neighbor's property line ends. And, you know, this is the process to get it. Oh, see, that makes it a little bit more oh, tangible. Okay. Right? <laughs> Also, an accolade for the government here, for the simple track requests, it's actually 25 days, not 250 days. In 2018, the costs for processing were not $5 billion, they were $500 million. And that means our truthful statistic is that the DHS indeed gets 45% of the requests. They are the largest department getting these requests. I didn't even consider that one. Yeah, I didn't either. <laughs> Yeah, that's a little weird. I'm unclear why, and I want to learn more. I assume it's something procedural, but uh, those are the stats according to justice.gov. All right, let's move on to wildfires. These statistics come to us from the Insurance Information Institute at iii.org. These are their fact statistics on wildfires. Oh, there's going to be some uh, area discussed in here. A lot of this was in acres, which I don't necessarily find intuitive. I've converted to miles for you guys, but we can go back and forth if you want. But here are some things for reference in case this is helpful for you. One square mile is 640 acres. A Rhode Island, the state, is 1,200 square miles. Illinois, the state, is 57,000 square miles. And Chicago, the city, is only 234 square miles. All right, with those prepped, here come the statistics. Four statistics on wildfires. The first will be the percentage of wildfires that are caused by people. The second will be the number of homes that are considered to be at risk. Third will be just how many there were in the first quarter of this year. And lastly, how many acres burned during that time or square miles. First statistic, possibly true or false. 
As many as 9% of wildfires in the United States are caused by people. Second statistic, 45 million U.S. homes were identified as high or extreme risk. And from January 1st to April 29th, 2021, Q1 this year, there were about 17,000 wildfires in the U.S. Last statistic, about 72,000 square miles were burned during that time. All right, Claudia, you go first. I think the true one is 7,200 square miles were burned. Vanessa, how about you? Yeah, Matt, now see, I was kind of pushing myself because I was forcing myself to believe it was 9% caused by people, but I felt like that was a lot because I'm also thinking there were only 1,700 fires. So I'm going to copy Claudia and say 7,200 square miles. It just makes sense to me. All right. Anybody want to change their answers? You're making me nervous. <laughs> I just want to be right once. <laughs> well, there'll be a third round for that, because in this round, you guys picked another fictional statistic. Ah, oh, no. <laughs> Sadly, as many as 90% of wildfires in the United States are caused by people. The second most common reason is lightning strikes. Next statistic. Uh, it's actually 4.5 million U.S. homes that were identified at higher extreme risk, not 45 million. So still a lot, but smaller scale. And then the Q1 statistics for this year, this was the truth. There were 17,000 wildfires in Q1 2021 in the U.S. Probably smaller ones than we would think about. It. Uh, yeah, I've, exactly. I've never been around a wildfire, so I don't know. Well, you're two Midwesterners, so yeah, I don't yeah. know, maybe... <laughs> Which indeed they would, in the long tail of these, they would have to be small because they did not in fact burn 7,200 right. square miles, but 720 <laughs> square miles, which is still quite a lot. But, you know, if you look at it from space as one square, it's not enormous. Now, maybe that was unfair because although I have been very fortunate to have not been directly affected by wildfires, some of our colleagues have. So I'm a little bit more close to it than you Midwesterners. So we're going to go into corn for our third and final category. Yay! <laughs> I know about that, hopefully. <laughs> All right, four statistics, one correct, the other three off by at least an order of magnitude. These statistics are around how much is planted, who is the largest producer, what country, how much of it goes into ethanol, and on one acre of land, anywhere from 2,200 to 3,500 individual plants may be grown. So these statistics come to us from a site you guys are probably familiar with. It's worldofcorn.com. I check it daily. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> they have some pretty nicely laid out statistics. One thing for your reference in case it's helpful. One bushel of corn is equal to about 56 pounds. So here are our statistics, three false, one truthful. 900 million acres of corn were planted in the U.S. in 2020. Also in 2020, the U.S. was the largest producer of corn in the whole planet. Third statistic, 2.6% of corn is used to produce ethanol fuel. And lastly, 1.4 million square miles in the U.S. were used to plant corn. All right, I'm going to flip a coin to see who goes first. Vanessa, heads or tails? Heads. Heads, you got it. Claudia, you go first. I feel like the 900 million is a lot. That's a lot of land. But then again, we're the largest producer of corn. I want to say that we are, but maybe that's just my ego getting in the way. <laughs> <laughs> I think we produce more ethanol with more corn than the 2.6% of corn. Vanessa, what do you think? <laughs> Oh my goodness. I really want the U.S. to win this corn thing, but I'm not feeling this 14 billion bushels part. It's like it's a trick question or something. I know. How many, what's the bushel again? It's One bushel has 56 pounds. Wow. that's That would be a lot of pounds of corn. Well, and as you both know, corn isn't just for eating. It's also for drinking, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I think the 2.6% of corn used to produce ethanol fuel, I think that's too low. I think we do more than that. So it sounds like you're split between the U.S. being the largest at 14 billion bushels or uh, one acre having 22 to 3,500 individual plants. That means like you just put the seeds down, right? Is that the individual plants or like you grow like various things in one acre? My understanding is that would be like stalks, like one stalk is one plant. Okay. Well, it's definitely not lower, right? I mean, could be just, but could it be bigger? 
That'd be a lot. Well, they are kind of thin, though. I guess. Or consider the alternatives on the bushels. Does uh, 140 billion or 1.4 billion sound right? Oh, it would be 1.4 billion. Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, probably like a million. That's why it's like, oh, uh, that 14 billion is a ton. But I'm like, I'm also on the same page where I'm thinking about how much fits in an acre because I'm just thinking about acreage of like my uncle's house, right? Like he lives on an acre, and I think that he could definitely have that many plants on his land because i feel like maybe i'm only believing it because that's an actual tangible frame of reference for me because if it's 14 billion bushels 2.6 percent of corn for ethanol i mean i guess that makes sense i don't know i really ah! I'm, I'm going with the acres the acres of 22,035 to 3500 individual plants i'm doing i'm jumping in all right that's your truth down to you claudia yeah i'm gonna do that one too yeah that was gonna be mine well it's a third sweep then because you were close but no, in fact, it's much more than that. 22,000 to 35,000 individual plants can be grown on a single acre. As you both had pretty astutely figured out, 2.6 is way too low for the percentage of corn going to ethanol. Yeah, it's 26% of corn yeah. is turned into ethanol. It is not 908 million acres of corn planted in the U.S. That was too big. It's 90 million acres. And those then okay. lead us to our correct mm -hmm. statistic that, in fact, in 2020, the U.S. was indeed the largest producer of corn, and we did indeed produce 14 billion bushels. Ah, uh, it really is more than corn in Indiana. Yeah. China is a close second uh, at about 80 percent of what we're doing. I thought that we were just taught that we were the best. <laughs> I didn't have as much faith as I needed to have. <laughs> oh, well, if the measure of a nation state is how much corn it can produce, we are indeed the best. <laughs> Well, there it goes. But I appreciate you guys sticking around for another fine-tuning round.